Debbie, Dave Margolis, UNC. That's um, a wonderful story. Thanks. Um, I would just like to sort of take the opportunity to say that I don't really like the term functional care because I think it's very confusing for the public and patients. And I noticed that, of course, since this is a small child, the limit of detection of infection in your resting cell assay was only two per, per million. But it was also interesting that you don't see any immune responses. So if this is a so-called functional cure and there's immune control, what's controlling the virus? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate your comment. And it's clear to us, you know, there are working definitions for sterilizing and functional cure, as you well know, put out by the IAS. And it's clear the pediatric population is just not going to fit in this category. And just we have not really had the opportunity to really describe what a sterilizing and functional cure would look like in the, in the pediatric population. The actual population. But clearly from the studies we're doing now in early treated children, the immune response is not going to be part of the picture. And, and I think we were cautious to use functional cure just as a, as a qualifier because, again, this is just uh, 10 months, actually now 12, 10 to 12 months of follow-up. The child is, is doing well. And we don't want, we don't really know if there is going to be re rebound. And it, uh, the intriguing data that Bob presented with respect to a mathematical model in how many logs drop do you need in reservoir size to be able to have rebound viremia, it is possible that we're still way below the limit of detection, as you pointed out, with culturing 22 million cells to not be able to recover that. But I think for all intents and purposes, this child has remained clinically undetectable off antiretroviral therapy for 10 to 12 months. And this, in our, in, in our view, this is a remarkable feat because we've never seen this in the treatment of any perinatally infected child. Rebound viremia occurs actually to up to over a million to 30 million copies per ml. That's standard for this population. Thank you for that okay. question. To give everybody a chance to ask a question, we need to have short questions and short, short answers. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Deborah. Fantastic work. Thank you very much. Uh, to short questions. First one is in regards of therapy for 18 months. Are you sure it was going on? Did you have any other markers uh, like MCV or so to judge or refill information since mother discontinued therapy on her own? Are you sure that for 18 months the therapy was indeed on board? Yeah, sure. I'll answer that question and, and then move to the next question. So we did have um, the pediatrician really carefully monitor the MCV value, which was um, increased as expected with zidovudine therapy, and then actually began to drop at about 15 months of age, which, which corresponded with actually prescription refills. But we decided to go with the story reported by the caretaker of 18 months of age as the time of treatment interruption. But it could have been as early as 15 months of age. Great. Thank you. And one second uh, part question. is the mother. Uh, is mother on therapy or not? Is she staying off treatment? Uh, uh, Pardon me? Mother of the child. She presented with rather low viral load. Is she being treated? Does she require antiretroviral therapy or not? Um, not to this point. Okay, thanks. Where to my we? knowledge. I'm not sure this is on. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's on. It is? Okay, good. Um, thank you so much for that very interesting report. And um, my question is about other genetic uh, studies that you may have done beyond the CCR5, uh, which, you, which you did, which is great. Um, but there are a, quite a number of genetic changes yeah. that can affect prog uh, course and outcome. And I wonder if you did any other genetic studies. Yeah, so this is a very uh, recent case, and it um, you know, requires so what we wanted to do is at least do the first baseline assessment, and then what we hope uh, going forward with um, parental consent to then begin to um, get expanded um, evaluation for other genetic markers. Over here on the right. Thank you. Steve Taylor from Birmingham in the UK. Um, two things which are a little bit unusual. Um, one is the very low maternal viral load at the time of delivery, and secondly, the the baby's viral load seems very low as well in somebody that was infected in utero. And I just wondered as to the timing of the when you think this baby was infected um, and whether that is uh, important in this particular case. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, there are uh, definitions for in utero infection versus uh, peripartum, intrapartum infection. And that definition is if you can detect uh, viral DNA or RNA within the blood of an, inf of an exposed infant in the first 48 hours of life, it's likely due to in utero infection. 
With respect to the viral load of 20,000 copies per ml, I don't think we have a lot of information. I mean, there's data from Yvonne Bison's study and HPTN040 in terms of the kinetics of um, virus replication and viral load variation in the first few days of life. And certainly some infants, maybe those infected longer, have higher viral loads. But it's important to point out, you know, the viral load of 20,000 copies per ml, this is still about a million virions within an infected infant when you take into account a 2.5 kilogram child with 80 cc's to 90 cc's per kilo of, of blood volume. Right. So it's still a large amount of virions present. Okay. Short questions, short answers. Thank you, Debbie. Richard Aquila, Chicago. Uh, on the low viral load, have you considered the possibility of attenuated virus being transmitted? Uh, so obviously, obviously we didn't recover virus from the infant, but we have looked at um, replication um, competent. We've cultured virus from the mom and have done some uh, studies that show it's, it's very replication competent. Okay, over here, Lisa. Lisa Frankel, University of Washington. Hi, Lisa. Very interesting case and nice presentation, and I've been trying to think about what possibly could have happened. And I'm wondering, kind of based on a case that Michael Bush described, and I think it was 2008, I'm wondering if um, the baby could have had a maternal transfusion, and then because the viral load differential, perhaps there was some um, host versus maternal graft stimulating virus production. And I'm wondering if there was any history uh, of the maternal transfusion, you know, a placental transfusion, and if, if there was antibody in the baby that could have been maternal, did you detect that? I guess she would have that anyway. So that's yeah. a multi-layered question. So the first has to do, does maternal transfusion of um, virions account for the persistent detection? I mean. It, to me, simply detection of RNA in the infant, that's exposure, that's infection, and then persistence through 19 days of age and the biphasic decay suggests establishment of infection. We did do the calculations, how much volume of blood would be required with a viral load of 2,500 copies, how much blood would have to be transfused into this infant. It turns out it would be like 250 mLs of blood to be transfused uh, from the placenta. So I really don't think, and, and even if it were um, from transfusion, that's what exposure is. It, it's... Uh, you know, transfusion of infected maternal blood into the infant. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that's the, the situation here, but it may have been, okay. and it just means yeah. that infection was not established in a, in a long-lived reservoir, but I, I don't really think that's what's uh, okay. contributing to this we here. We need to go on, John, really short. Um, quickly, was there any evidence at all after the baby reappeared and, and re returned to care, was there, I was a little bit confused by the presentation. Was there any evidence at all for infection at that point? Uh, no. No No antibody, no DNA? No antibody. No. So the only evidence antibody. we have, John, is really these, the trace nucleic acids that we're detecting now, DNA and RNA, two different samples, PBMCs and plasma, and I think that requires okay. um, careful follow-up to see. It's just, it's at the limit of detection of these assays, so I don't know what's assay and noise versus a real genetic footprint of the virus, and I think that would actually be definitive proof if we did detect persistent HIV DNA, but not replicating at this point. And, and was the baby being cared for by the same people before yes, and, and after actually return? We, the, the baby's being cared for it, and we did look at the growth. The growth curve was the only thing we had available, and the, the growth with, with respect to weight and height has been consistent from birth to uh, 24 months of age. Okay, over here, please, really short. Hi, my name is Sita Pabairare, I'm from Emory University. I have a, a short question and short comment. My short question is, um, so you, did you able to isolate the, re-isolate the virus from this baby and then you characterize those virus isolated in virological point of view? Yeah, so we've only done one culture. I mean, we plan on doing more, and, and 22 million cells were unable to recover uh, replication competent virus at this point. Okay, and uh, thank you. And my comment is, uh, so based on this data, you think uh, entire HIV management is going to change? That means the moment you know the person is HIV positive and they're going to get the drugs, that's what we are looking for yeah. future? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think this is a single case. I mean, obviously there are many questions around it. We need to confirm and we need to replicate it. And certainly if it's replicated, we, we yeah, we do think this will transform okay. management of children to last, a cure. Thank last you. two questions here. Please make them short. Was therapy IV or PO and when it changed if it started as IV? No, therapy was oral. 
And was the infant breastfed? Non-breastfed. Thank you for that question. I'm sorry? Non-breastfed. Last question. Tai Li from Beijing, China. One simple question. And uh, for your patients after treatment, in very earlier treatment after delivery, and the RNA DNA become negative on the care. But one thing is very strange is the IgG is become negative because for, for even for other virtual, other virtual disease, once the infection building, even after recovery, Care company, the IgG antibody maintained for at least two, three years positive, even for SARS patients. Yeah. So this is a very common outcome of early therapy in children, even though started at a median of three months of age. And, and, po and poster 171, you can stop by that poster and see that. In fact, 80% of, of children in the U.S. tested who are treated as uh, before three months of age who maintain suppression are HIV seronegative. Okay. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.